thank you all for coming today. We are gathered here to remember a brilliant surgeon, a kind mentor, a wonderful dad. Um, well, when you look at the tables on each end, there are places if you haven't seen before where you can write a note to the family. We'll make sure the family receives all of those. One question that people have had is, uh, where could we donate to make something meaningful? So there are uh, envelopes for the Charitable Foundation there. Uh, what Trauma Services is looking into is having something that would be significant to Dr. Gehan. And so what they're looking at is, is a, a memorial of of having a scholarship available for residents so they can take a class they might not be able to otherwise. Uh, I don't know that that's finalized, so keep in contact with Trauma Services on that. But if you would like to do uh, a donation, that is certainly a place that you can place, place that. So those envelopes are available if you would like to take one. Now as we gather today, uh, we're going to start with Dr. Stan and Dustin, who's I'm going to share some memories about Dr. Gehan. standing in the back, there are plenty of spots in the front <laughs> to make yourselves comfortable. Um, I've not been known to project, but I'm really glad that we have this microphone this afternoon so that you all can hear me. I um, was asked to um, make some comments uh, about uh, Dr. Guillen Douglas. Doug to a lot of us, Dr. G to me. Um, I'm going to start first by reading a little something out of his uh, memorial services up here with the family. Um, and I'm quoting, Doug grew up in El Lago, Texas, and in New Orleans. He attended high school at St. Martin's Episcopal and studied at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. In college, Dartmouth, he was a swimmer and a member of Phi Beta Kappa. Doug served as a surgeon at Trinity Medical Center in Kansas City, taught medical students at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and served on the board of directors of the Heartland Presbyterian Center. There's more to that uh, comment, and hopefully we'll be able to make that available. But I wanted to start there. When you read these, this information from memorial service and a CV, you get an outline of what a person is. And that's good for someone who just knows someone superficially. If you didn't know them very well, you used to read that in the paper and you get an idea. But to most of us here, he was a lot more. He was much more than that. He was a son, he was a father, husband, brother. But to us at Truman, a teacher, mentor, colleague, and friend. So just by this turnout today, you can see that he touched a lot of lives and we'll miss that. Um, Dr. Guillen Doug was a personal, private sort of individual, and we respect that. But as you know him and get to know him, and there's little tidbits when you walk by your office, sit down and talk, come to the doctor's lounge, chit-chat in the CT scanner. You learned a little bit about him. <laughs> Over the years, we learned a lot about him. He was a very remarkable individual. <clears throat> Things that you learned about his personal life was kept close to him, but he let it out periodically. Really, from a lot of people, we found out what he liked and what he didn't like. Through Facebook, he was, you know, <laughs> it was a means that we really tell what uh, Dr. Cannon thought. Um, he was proud primarily of his family. We all knew what the kids were doing. Mm -hmm. Kathy went to school in England. 
Jennifer was, I don't see her actually night or day. She was a pilot working for SpaceX. Matt did a lot of different things and just recently got married, so he was very proud of that. And even recently, I just remember him always coming back from Florida a lot, a lot more than you think of vacation, but he was always happy when he came back. So that was just one of his favorite places. Um, for a lot of you who don't know, Doug and I, we shared office space for over 10 years. Uh, every Monday and Thursday we were together. And over that time, you learn a lot about the person. What he liked, what he disliked. Things that I learned about him. You learn how to the Socratic method of teaching. You learned about his love of the Beatles. You learned about his love to travel. You learned about his environment, environmentally and naturally sourced foods that he was proud of. His quote unquote hippie food, as he called it. <laughs> um, he was very, uh, we spent a lot of time talking about that. And his love for life. Um, other things that we shared is his love of astronomy and space, space X where his daughter worked. And we watched a number of the recent space launches in our office uh, together, so he was very interested in that. Um, I think I speak for the surgery department. We thank you for all of your comments and well wishes. It's been really uh, comforting to me as a number of people have come up to me and asked me how I was doing and how the department was doing with that. And we worked together in this department for 20 years, so we do appreciate that. And just lets me know that it was well loved and it will be missed. Um, just the other day, I was sitting in my office <coughs> doing charts. <laughs> and I heard his footsteps down the hall. And I immediately thought Doug was coming down the hall. And so. I think that's about the rest of all of my uh, prepared comments. I'm going to let you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Lauren. I'm the music therapist here at Truman. And I didn't know Dr. Gehan. And so part of my hope is that involving people in the music today would help. Uh, because we are a family and a community here at Truman. So I'm going to invite a, um, a nurse that knew him very well, Sarah Keel, and we're going to sing How Great Thou Art. Mm. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder Consider all The worlds thy hands have made I see the stars I hear the rolling thunder I power throughout Oh God, you saw not very. 
pictures and we're going to enjoy a piece on the piano that is written by our diabetes nurse educator Connie Kleinbeck. standing outside the trauma of the room we're kind of looking in and somebody said oh that's the surgeon oh okay it's okay he's there then um, I would ask him every time I saw him how are you doing Dr. Gehan he would say outstanding <laughs> up till last year or so and he would just say good and I knew I was hoping to see here outstanding again someday uh, as we're up here I would invite everyone to come up to take a stone. It'll be your memory, a representative of that. And just tell us a little bit about your memory of Dr. Gehan. When you're done, just set it in the water. And we're going to bring all of our memories together. And there's going to be a giant pool of great stories that we share. Who would like to go first? Just like in church, I know it takes a minute. I did notice the front row's empty, so it's just like in church. Uh, 
Um, I'm Kathleen Rectine, and I work in the recovery room, but I also worked with him in ICU for many years. And uh, one of the things I remember so distinctly is I would, one day I had a patient, or he had a patient that he was operating on, and he was doing a lap coli. So I said, Dr. Gigno, um, are you going to admit that patient with the lap coli? And he looked at me in true Dr. Gihan fashion. Yes, it's almost like they had a real surgery. <laughs> I never asked him that again. <laughs> um, I know all of us on the second floor um, will always love him. He was truly a pillar here at Truman. And um, I just bought one of these to bring today because everybody on the second floor will always remember him and his Thanksgiving gift. We always celebrate Thanksgiving together as a family, but it wasn't really Thanksgiving until the apples came out that Dr. Giddy had always brought. So I just wanted to uh, leave that in way. My name is Michael Monk here, and I'm probably the person in this room that's worked here the least amount of time. <laughs> However, I have to tell you, I, I told uh, some people the other day during our residency celebration of uh, Doug, I've probably known him longer than anyone else in this room, besides uh, family. Right? <laughs> um, I, uh, I performed my fellowship at Shock Trauma in 93-94, and Doug was a third year resident on the uh, surgery service. And uh, my, my friends and I were still around, uh, like Doug the most, out of all the University of, of, of uh, Maryland residents, they would all do what you residents know, oh, that's patients not on our service, we're not taking that patient. <laughs> we would always go to Doug, because he always, always did the right thing. He always said, no, we'll take that patient. I know they're going to beat up on me, you know, my chief resident, but I'll just, I just want to do the right thing for the patient. And he, always has done the same thing. Uh, when I came to Kansas City, I was on the other side for 20 years. He'd always tell me, I mean, you're wasting your time. You need to come over here. <laughs> and he told me the other day, the Saturday before he passed away, a couple things he was proud of. He said, I knew it where you down. <laughs> and the other thing he was really proud of is that he got that third parking space for the trauma <laughs> surgery. <laughs> Definitely use it, so we should all make sure that we uh, do that. But he was a pillar. He was uh, always solid. He was devoted to this institution. We talked about our different pathways, and I wish that I had picked a place that I stayed. And this is evidence of what family is like. This is a family, and he was a major part of that. And uh, I think he's very proud of his legacy. And one of the last things he was able to accomplish was American College of Surgeons uh, verification. That's huge. And that, along with the individuals that work in that trauma department, all of all of you in this room you know uh, lay testimony to that. So I just, I couldn't resist but say something, but it was great to know him. And uh, your family, you guys should be very proud. So unlike Dr. Moncure, I'm probably one of the people who's been here the longest. <laughs> For those who don't know me, I'm Mark Steele, and uh, certainly knew Dr. McGee and his entire, you know, more than 23 years here. And there are a couple of things that I didn't know, having known him for such a long time, that he likes hippie food, evidently, which I did not know. And it also appears that he drove a Tesla. Is that accurate? <laughs> which uh, I also did not know. Um, but I would just echo what Dr. Moncure said. Uh, Dr. DeGian did a lot of really important things here. Uh, he's best known for leading the trauma program, but he also has done a number of other things. He's lately led the oncology program, and when we have our Commission on Cancer visits by the American College of Surgeons, he's, he was always front and center. And he also served on the board of the university, uh, what was called UPA, University Physician Associates, and now UHP for three years, and also was vice chair on that on that board. And one thing that happened was, in the way our bylaws read, is that you, you could be nominated for two, three-year terms to the board, or elected, I should say, 
he was elected to the first three year three year term and then he was vice chair but then he didn't get elected to the second term so all of a sudden you have a vice chair and this happened twice and so he actually was very astute and came to us and said hey you know this doesn't make a lot of sense that you have a vice chair who then cannot then ascend to the to the uh, chair position and so we changed those bylaws and I call that the Guillen Amendment so <laughs> anyway we will definitely miss him So I'm Charlie, I'm the, the CEO here at Truman, I've been at Truman just short of 10 years. And one of the things that um, I love about this institution, this organization, is that you can look around and, and see people and they are the faces of Truman. They are just who we are. And uh, Dr. Guillen was probably one of the most prominent of those faces because he epitomized what we're all about I mean that level of service so you know we have that saying um, around here the the brightest minds biggest hearts mm -hmm. and uh, people described it and when I went to the memorial service on Sunday people described Doug and I, I think we all knew it but people I grew up with him just absolute brilliance um, that he was he just had that gifted minds that brightest minds and then the, the absolute level of humility that he had because in this business sometimes there are people that are really bright but they lack the humility they lacked the biggest heart so when we talk about Truman brightest minds biggest heart that was Doug Gehan and that's the face of Truman and, and I think that's what uh, not only we will remember um, but we'll miss but that will carry forward the other thing that um, uh, Dr. Monker talked about, the, the just recent accomplishment uh, of the, the American College of Sur Surgeons verification of our trauma program. We all knew it was a great program. We know it by the reputation of this community. But that was the validation, the verification of the work that Dr. Gehan and everybody that makes up that trauma team did. So, if there's something that kind of epitomizes the last big accomplishment of his life, I think that is one of those things that will carry forward and be meaningful ever in this, in this institution. That's why I'm not a I'm Andrea. I work in the trauma services department as the educator and um, had the pleasure of having close knit with uh, Dr. Dean for many, many, many classes. That is one thing that we are known for here is doing a ton of trauma outreach and education. And he was always front and center of that, making sure everything was going on. And um, he would always come to my office before ATLS because we do a ton of them. And he would say, what problem are we anticipating for this class? Because there's always a glitch, and there's always a problem, and who's going to drop out, and who's not coming, and who's going to fail, and who are we going to have to argue with? And so it was always a point of discussion prior to the class. And so we'd always get into the class, and then that discussion would move to the food. So there would always be a topic about the food, because he always wanted to make sure the learners wanted for nothing, you know, make sure they have snacks, make sure they have drinks, we need to make sure they have more drinks and more snacks. And um, so I'm kind of the hostess with the most of anyways. I come from an Italian family and you gotta feed people and they, they need to have food. So I, I was on board with him, but he was always worried about that. And so I remember him always going, you know, I know Gates some one time didn't do us right and they didn't get there on time and the food wasn't all that great. I think we should try again. And he came to my office one day and he said, you know what, I went to Gates the other day and they have gone downhill. I don't, I, don't, I don't think, I think we should just stick with Jack's life. So he would always have some kind of comment that he could make that class better. and. Um, I really appreciate that a lot of the times there's some downtime in ATLS, which doesn't happen that often, but when they're testing, um, there would always be that downtime where we're just kind of waiting for everybody to come through. And those are the times that I remember most about Dr. Dean, because a lot of times he would open up about 
you know, what was going on in his life and how things were going and just personal things that became more of a relationship than it was a doctor um, the nurse just working relationship like that and so really miss a lot of the times that he comes by my office and sometimes you know in the moment you might find it slightly annoying that he's going to take a seat in my chair across from my desk and talk to me for about 30 minutes <laughs> not so much stuff to do but i miss it i miss it now that he's not stopping by my office every day and seeing how things are going and asking him how he's doing and he would always say i was standing <laughs> Which that was his catchphrase, and didn't really matter how he was really feeling. You know, I always asked him. I asked him one time because I was like, "Why do you always outstanding? You keep outstanding every day." And he's like, "Well, I may not be feeling outstanding, but me as a person, I'm outstanding." <laughs> um, so I, I I appreciated that. He always had that dry sense of humor, which was very appreciative. But. He's getting a great in this. He was a pillar of our trauma services department, and um, it's just, it's hard. So, it's just, I'm missing. So my name's Betty Spalding, and I'm currently the corporate director of nursing quality. But I first joined Truman Medical Center in 1976. I don't know, Mark, where that stands with you, but it's been a long time ago. Um, my first interactions with Dr. Gehan was when I became the director of the ICU, and I too will miss those times when he came by my office and was offering uh, suggestions for improvement of nursing care in the ICU. <laughs> But the one thing I can honestly say out of all the years that I was the director of the ICU, I never once had a nurse come to me and say, I'm having a problem with Dr. Gehan, or I'm not getting the orders from Dr. Gehan that I need, or Dr. Gehan is not listening to us, or he's not listening to the family. Um, Dr. Gehan challenged me frequently. He was truly an intellectual. When I thought I had my hands around a situation, I honestly think he honestly think he loved putting that fly in my appointment and that smile that he had when he did that was just absolutely incredible and he challenged me to go research and come back to him and more times than not I thanked him for for challenging me and causing me to to try and begin to think on the scope that he thought um, and just most recently he realized that I was sick and um, I'm going to miss those hugs, and he would come to me every time he saw me. He would walk my direction and say, how are you today? And I had the pleasure of telling him, outstanding. <laughs> I'm not a surgeon, but I could be. <laughs> I think there may be a theme of Dr. Gehan popping into people's office and sitting there. Uh, so there were two, two types of times he would pop into my office. Uh, the first one I don't really miss. This is when he would tell me all the things that was going wrong with the ER and trauma. Uh, once in a while he was right. Some, some of the times I would seriously argue with him, but, but always uh, with a, a smile on each of our space. Uh, the other times would be during ATOS, he would pop in and sit down and basically just schmooze for a while. I really won't miss the first conversations, but the schmoozing ones were very good, and I will miss that a lot. <laughs> I'm glad my mama <laughs> My respect to the family first and foremost. And head Truman. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Tanisha Wilkins. I'm a patient access representative, patient access scheduling representative. So I have two jobs here, um, which is less than Dr. Gehan, but hey. Um, <laughs> I am not here because Dr. Gehan was my coworker. I am here because Dr. Gehan saved my life. I was introduced to this hospital May 11, 2013 because 
my intestines were collapsing and KU did not know what was going wrong with me. And I was going to die. And so I lost my insurance May 8th. I came here May 11th. Dr. Gehan said, put her up in surgery. He saved my life. He saved my life not once, not twice, but three times. And when he realized he couldn't save my life again, he called the next surgeon to save my life next. <laughs> and um, after that, because I came here as a patient with a gold card, and I came here, I am the definite face of Truman. This is the beginning of the story, but my God, God is totally the end of the story with Truman, okay? Um, after that, I had the pleasure of starting to work here. And as I started to work here, where did I start working at? The surgery clinic, baby. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. One thing I love about Dr. Gehan, he never dumbed you down, but he was one of the most brilliant men I've ever met. But he would never talk to me like I didn't know exactly what he was talking about. And if I did not know what I needed to know to help a particular patient, he would bring it to me. He would let me know this is exactly right. He didn't treat me like, hey, you know what I'm saying, just push the paperwork, sis, get done. He, he knew that my, my position with Truman was just as important as anyone else's. And now I work with him in the ED. So I work with traumas. And when he walks down that trauma hallway, everybody gets quiet. <laughs> with him, Dr. Moncure, Dr. Augustine hit that trauma, and Dr. Dr. Kramer, they know, shut up. <laughs> shut up, it's serious. <laughs> and he would just come on down the hallway, no matter what the trauma was, type A trauma here now, type B trauma, trauma code. He's walking right in the exact same way. <laughs> and so, one of my favorite memories with Dr. Gehan, other than him saving my life, praise God, was, um, for a lot of you faces that know me, you know that my hair changes, baby. If they sell it, I'm going to buy it. I'm going to buy it. I'm going to buy it. Long, short, curly, wet, straight. I'm going to buy that hair. He walked up to me one day in my little funky office and said, so did you just have like a thing? <laughs> and I said, no, baby, but I make them. <laughs> So it was so funny because he would, so when he would see my real hair, he would be like, I'm like, no, this is how I'm grown. <laughs> and I just love that about him. And then he just was so amazing. And um, there's nothing else. Honestly, there are no words that anyone in this room that can say that actually puts together everything that he is and everything that he encompassed as a man, everything that he brought to Truman and the pride that he brought to trauma services. So if you never elbow rubbed with him and you're just here for respect, thank you. But if you ever elbow rubbed him, I know you miss him because we all do. Hi, my name is Sarah. I'm one of the ICU nurses, but my actual first encounter with Dr. Gehan was when I was a tally nurse. And I, first of all, I did get permission to share this story from his lovely daughter. Um, but she was hospitalized with us uh, with her Crohn's disease, and um, I was a brand new nurse. I think I'd been a nurse maybe a year at the time. And um, finding out that I have this incredible general surgeon's daughter in my room, I was like, oh gosh. <laughs> like, try to play it cool, like, you totally know what you're doing. <laughs> and, um, but it turned out to be really fantastic. I got along really well with her. Um, but my favorite story during that time was just to see him switch from surgeon to father in a split second. Um, because obviously, you know, I was intimidated by him and who he was as a surgeon, not at all as a father. And um, one day when Sweet Kathy was finally not in PO, um, <laughs> uh, she, she was finally able to eat. And so the first thing he did, I think he had been working. And the first thing he did, he came up to visit her. Um, and she said she wanted Big Biscuit. And you better believe it, he left and came back with Big Biscuit <laughs> the, second, the second he had the opportunity. So, I mean, she didn't have the words out of her mouth before he was like, all right, gotcha. And just left. He, the... The side of him that I got to see during the hospitalization was truly in honor, um, and it definitely made us connected from there on out. Every time we would meet at, meet down at the ICU, I had moved down there, and we get to connect. I would ask about Kathy. I don't even know if she remembers me, but I would ask about Kathy and just check on how she was doing, and it just created this awesome this awesome friendship with this incredible surgeon. So I was I was honored to cross paths in that way.
<laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Dustin Neal. I'm one of the trauma surgeons who nobody gets quiet for when they go into trauma. <laughs> Only doctors, Kramer, Augustine. <laughs> That being said, I am one of the younger sur or surgery attendings. I was one of the first surgery attendings to come that hadn't been here for a while. Um, and if you can imagine being a young buck in an established pen, it was not exactly the easiest situation to be in. That's not how Dr. Gehan does it. That's not how Dr. Augustin did it. That's not how you name the person. And so it was challenging. Uh, I also worked at St. Luke's at the time, part-time, and so we were constantly in flux about who would do what, when, where, and how, and there were always differences of opinions. However, despite all of the ups and downs and the arguments we had, um, there was a night, it was about nine months into my attending this, and I realized I wasn't as smart as I thought I was. <laughs> And I had a case, it was a simple, should have been a simple case that did not go very simply. And I didn't really know who to call because I was trying to be the cool new attending. <laughs> and Dr. Gehan was my backup. And I was like, well, I'll call him because technically I'm allowed to do that. <laughs> and so I called him and it was trying to decide whether or not I was going to take out the cecum with the appendix or not because the base of the appendix had busted. And, I was pretty sure that's what I was supposed to do, but at the same time, you don't want to do that and it not be right when you're still new. And Dr. Gehan was like, yeah, that's what I would do. And I was like, okay, good. Hang up the phone. Yes. <laughs> Five minutes later, Dr. Gehan calls me back and he's like, hey, do you need me to come in? Um, no. So that's okay, I'm just making sure. I just wanted to offer that for you. Um, I know what it's like to be a new attending and maybe need help and, and that sort of thing. The case ultimately went fine. The next day he comes into my office and sits down. <laughs> he proceeds to talk to me about the case just to make sure everything had gone okay. He wasn't really worried about the dynamics of the department at the time, nor was he worried about becoming friends. He was more worried about making sure I was okay in the moment in a stressful situation. Um, I learned that very quickly and adapted that uh, as part of my practice as well and I've helped some people out when they call and learned that he was always there. He would always be a phone call away, whether he was on call, not on call, in Florida. I called him once in Florida <laughs> just to ask for advice and he'd always answer and give you his opinion um, and let you know that you were doing okay. And so he was always kind of the go-to person for our department just to bounce ideas off of. Even if, even if you thought you knew what you were doing, you would always like a second opinion. The other big thing about Dr. Gehan is he remembered everything. He, know, he knew my dog's name. Most people do, but I mean, like, he knew my dog's name. And he would send me pictures of stuff that he had fumbled through some god-awful catalog. <laughs> and he said, does Jake need this? <laughs> and I would laugh and say, no, I don't think he needs an automatic treat dispenser. <laughs> and so, but one of the things he got for me was this tie. For those of you who don't know, it's American College of Surgeons tie. I didn't know they made these. Um, and Dr. Farnshaw, who's not here, and I got inducted at the same time. Dr. Gehan went to about four stores to find this tie um, because he thought that I should have one because he said, and I quote, you finally make it. <laughs> and so it, it, it didn't mean as much to me at the time but just the simple, because again, I was a new young buck, and I was like, what do I need a new tie for? I look great in my scrubs. But, <laughs> but it means a lot that he went out of his way to remember something that I may not have recognized at the time of how important it was, but it is now. And I miss him a lot, and there are big shoes to fill with everything that he's accomplished. But the first thing I remembered is about two days after he passed, I had a 
trauma not go well. And I said, I've got to go talk to Dr. Geekhan about this. And I went, oh no, now what am I going to do? And so us as a department, we appreciate everything that you guys have said to us in passing, making sure that we're okay. <laughs> we're making it, but we're going to need your continued support to, to get through this. Thank you. No, I most definitely can't talk to this. <laughs> Perfect score. <laughs> give everyone a chance, even the shy ones. All these stories have made me think of a thousand war stories, and nobody's mentioned visiting Dr. Gigan in his office yet. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kara. I'm a scrap pick. My story is not that big, but when I came here three years ago, one day after a trauma, I decided to go to a bridge to sit down for a moment because it was a, a little bit difficult for me at the beginning. And then I saw him coming and then I, I was like, oh boy. <laughs> you know, you decided to be like invisible, but you are not. <laughs> because being the only Latina in the room, it's like impossible. <laughs> and then he was walking slow and then stand in front of me and he said, howdy. <laughs> Hi sir, how are you? And he said, I'm standing. <laughs> and how are you doing? I'm like, I don't think I'm doing okay. I think I'm gonna go back to where I came from because this place, I don't think I'm made up to be here because it's really hard for me. This place should deserve somebody stronger than me. And he sat next to me and and that bridge, you can see all the people walking around with the council in the back. <laughs> Some of them smoking, and he made me stand up, and he said, you see all these people around there? They deserve humans like us. They deserve people like us. And he said, among all these He said, you are made to be here. You are one of us now. And I only be here for maybe two or three weeks. And I didn't even know that he knew my name. And I used to write my name around the gun cars when we were scrubbing and they were busy. And my I write my name Carlita, and he's and he said, "Just remember, you're not Carlita, you're Carlota. <laughs> <laughs> you can be tiny, but you're not tiny. You are mighty. <laughs> you're gonna do more things than you even you don't even know because you you can speak two languages." And he starts telling me all these things, and we. We finished talking, he said, No, are you okay? <laughs> and I'm like, Yeah, I'm okay. But I, I really, at the moment, I wasn't. I really wanted just to run away because I was, I didn't know <laughs> how, who he, you know, how he was. I couldn't, yeah. And then he said, Just go and make sure you do a great job for them. I'll be right here every time you need me to talk to you. Aww. A few years later, my grandfather died. And somehow, he found out and I was sitting again in the bridge. <laughs> Which is my go-to place. <laughs> <laughs> don't go there. Apparently, he 
kind of like to walk right there. <laughs> he was like, how are you doing? I'm like, yeah, I'm hanging in there. And he's like, he's going to get better. He's watching after you. I think he may not hate you. We have a great team of doctors, and we appreciate it of all you guys and all you do for us. We love you. My sins and condolences for the family. We love him so much. He was always there for us. say something, this is the time to do it. It's this is Kathy, Dr. Deanne's daughter. So question, uh, ATLS, does that permit students or is that for residents? <coughs> Who takes ATLS courses? Residents. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, apparently Dad like to also involve his kids in his security method. <laughs> <laughs> because before ATLS had uh, like actors or, or whoever it is used now, uh, he used his children. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I, I remember he would always sit in Matt's room uh, because Matt was the youngest, and he was the 52-year-old liquor stronger who was shot twice. <laughs> I, I wasn't there because I was the 24-year-old in a one-car collision with a brick wall. Uh, but I've heard these stories often enough, they feel kind of like my own memories. And, uh, and I said at one point there was a resident who was um, not doing super great. And my brother was unconscious. But he opened up his eyes and he looked at Dad and he said, Dad, this guy sucks. <laughs> and, uh, he did so. <laughs> I had to retake the course. <laughs> and then one of us, I, I, I want to say it was my sister, um, kept a kill count on the whiteboard. <laughs> Today I have been killed X times. Uh, because we picked up on the whole you know, intimidation piece, uh, subconsciously, I suppose. Um, but that was part of it, you know, was to, to kind of try and simulate the pressure of the situation as much as possible. Um, so I think we're all kind of disconnected, but the, the other one I remember, um, I think Matt and Jim were trying to go find the food, and they, they give us makeup, you know, and so someone called and said, hey, two of your patients are running around, they have like gunshots and things. Um, my dad was like, okay, first of all, help them. <laughs> UPS guy doing in the back room because <laughs> he because uh, I work for UPS and I had uh, taken off work for the day when he told me that he had uh, he had fallen and broken his arm and it was just it was kind of funny to see how everybody had knew me and I knew none of you guys 
and, and the people who didn't know me were asking me what I was doing in the in the back room because uh, that's not where packages go. <laughs> but my dad always had a uh, a keen sense to 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 know when a, a situation was getting tense or if anything was. Uh, Going away, and, and he always had a, a really good sense of humor that would, you know, brighten up anyone's day. And, and I know, for me, he always made sure that I was doing okay with whatever I was doing because I'm the one kid that didn't go to college. I'm the 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 you know, Jen and Kathy both were accredited. Kathy went to Queens College in London, did good things there. Jen went to the Florida Institute of Technology and became an aerospace engineer, and I was a college dropout. But he never gave up on me. And, uh, you know, I'm now married to my wife, Hannah, who's also with me, who's hiding her face. <laughs> but, but he never gave up on me, and, you know, that speaks wonders for him, because, you know, he's accredited heavily. Both my sisters were, but he never called me a failure. He never told me I wasn't doing good things, because, you know, I was doing things my own way. You know, I never liked school, so he was... Uh, a little upset that I didn't go to school, though, I could tell, but, he, you know, he was always there, and that meant a lot, so, I appreciate all you guys for coming here, it means a lot to, to our family, I know, and uh, if Jen could be here, I know she would, but she's down in Florida, because plans got to make themselves, right? <laughs> Thank you, guys. I could also be a surgeon. <laughs> I'll be very brief. My name is Marguerite. I used to work in the operating room and in the ICU for a long time. And <coughs> Dr. Hand was somebody who, every time I saw him coming, I never questioned. I never got apprehensive. You know, sometimes you, you see people and you're like, oh God. <laughs> Never. Not one time in the whole time I knew him. That's my biggest memory of him. Not one time. I was always, he was always welcome. When I worked weekend all, he would come sometimes into my office. That would be the break room. <laughs> and he, would, uh, he would sit down and chat with me and stack and then he would just be gone. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> And that's, that's going to be my fondest memory of him, just knowing that he would show up in my office and chat with me, and he could always come into my other office, OR suite, and I was always like, it's perfect, let's do it. Always calm, always collected, there's never anything too big to handle, and I think I took a little of that from him, and I want to thank him for that, so thank you. <laughs> I'm Diane. I work in the ER. Um, my main memory of Dr. Gehan was when he came down for all the traumas and many times, and I'd say especially the last year that I remember that we just stand there in the hallway and have a conversation, you know, when a trauma wasn't going on or he, for whatever reason he was down there and then um, one of the Spanish interpreters couldn't be here, but she, we've had many talks over the last couple weeks since Dr. Gehan passed. And she said she wanted to make sure that um, her memory of him was, she said she called the patients her people, and um, she said that he, one thing she, he all, she admired about him was because of the fact that he always, when there was bad news, he always broke it to them in the most gentle way. And he was just so kind. So even though there's people that can't be here, there he's oh so thought of. And you guys are so lucky to the family of Dr. Gehan. You guys are so lucky to have a member. He's such an incredible man. Um,
Hi, my name is Rudy. I work in the GI. I was forced by my cohort to talk. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I've known Dr. Gian for a long time. Uh, he would always call me early in the morning and they'll say, Hey Rudy, how are you doing? Do I have a case today? <laughs> Do I have a colonoscopy? And I'd say, I'll go check Dr. Pihan. And then I'll tell him, oh, you got two cases around the world clock, and he'll say, outstanding. <laughs> and then he'll come uh, around 12, and uh, I'm really amazed that uh, for the people who talked here, that he always sat down in your office. <laughs> he never sat down in my office. He was always up and talking to me and just following me so he can get the procedure going. Uh, uh, I'm uh, really very impressed with Dr. Vian. He was a very kind man. Uh, even though he and I had disagreement with the timing of the procedure, because we were late, he was always respectful and humble to me. You know, and I appreciate that. And I knew a couple of his kids. Um, we used, uh, they used to play soccer against each other. I think you're, you're the guy, but I forgot your name. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we always talk out in the soccer field about our kids, and he was uh, very proud of his family, and uh, that I appreciate. So I sure will miss him. Thank you. one thing I wanted to say. It's, it was pretty clear your dad is very proud of all, all three of you guys. So, um, I'm Angela. I'm the wound care nurse practitioner here. I told my story to Jeff because I didn't think I'd be able to tell it to people, but I'm going to try to get through it. Anyway, um, I've been here 25 years. I was in school to be a nurse practitioner you know, about three years ago, and so I needed a preceptor for a specialty area. So the first person I thought of was Dr. Gihin. I was just like, I've worked with him, you know, I do a lot of ostomies, you know, take care of those patients, so we work together a lot. So I just went and asked him, I was like, would you be willing to preset me um, to do some specialty hours? He said, sure, no problem. So we got it approved. So apparently he didn't tell his residents that I was coming. <laughs> so the day that I started clinicals, there were like three or four residents in the room, and I came in and told him who I was, and he wasn't there yet. So we were just sort of chatting, and the residents really didn't know what to do with me. So one of them just said, okay, well, you're going to follow me. And I was like, oh, okay. I wasn't really sure that's the way that was supposed to go. But I was like, okay. So I went with him, and I was just sort of like a scribe when we went to see the first patient. And so he came out, and Dr. Gainhan's like, hey, do you have a patient? I said, well, the, I went with the resident. And he could tell that I was like, I wasn't sure what was going on, and he told the resident, he pretty much straightened him out right then and said, uh, she's doing her own patients, she can handle this, let her go and do her thing. And he was like, oh, I'm sorry. So, you know, so then I felt like I was more of an equal, you know, in the learning um, environment there with the residents, and I really, really appreciated him doing that, because I wasn't sure how that experience was going to go, and I went every week, you know, for seven or eight weeks, and I was just right there along with all the residents, just answering questions, getting challenged, and I really, I really appreciated that. Hello, I'm Jennifer Spalbomber, and I've worked with Dr. Gingham the whole time I've worked here, 22 and a half years. And my, I have lots of memories of him, but one of them that will stand with me for a long time is I was working a night shift, and some night shifts are fun, some are not so fun. <laughs> and I was in a case with him, with a patient that we had called the GI team in for, and that patient was somewhat stable. Well, in the middle of doing that, we had a trauma that was a stab to the heart. And some of you might remember this story when I tell it. I won't say the patient's name. And it was me, our scrum, the GI team, him. And they call it from the ER. The trauma patient goes off, a stab to the heart. And he said, Jennifer, just go. So I proceeded to set up the other room. 
the patient came in, Dr. Farnjad came in, we did the case, the call team came in. By the time they got spoke, the heart shut. And he was very calm. He stayed in the, patient, the other patient's room and made sure that he could circulate <laughs> and did that. The call team came in, we got the patient off the table. The patient lived and if he had probably hadn't encouraged me to do that, I don't know if the outcome would have been the same because the call team obviously wasn't going to get there that fast. And after that, he wrote a letter to my supervisor and recognized me for that, but really the recognition should have been on him because he encouraged me to do that. And without his encouragement, I wouldn't have because I would have like, oh crap. <laughs> but it turned out well for everybody. And he thought that through, never hesitated. And to this day, that's why we are here and we do do a good job with all of that. And all of you over there do just as well. Yep. And you're going to fill his shoes with no problems. Okay? We all love you. <laughs> now, was it his favorite OR room? Because I hear he had the favorite OR room. We were inside, we went to two. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and Jan was our spread that night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Esmat Sadidi. I'm a gastroenterologist and uh, I've known uh, Doug for uh, almost 16 years, since 2004 when I started my fellowship here. And uh, as you know, GI and surgery, we were close uh, with each other and we had a lot of heated discussions, <laughs> sometimes uh, beyond imagination. But, uh, and as one of my colleagues mentioned, is that Dr. Gihan, one thing about him is that the amount of passion he has towards his patients is beyond explanation. Uh, but one thing I learned from Doug, uh, well, I learned quite a bit of stuff, is that the calm uh, approach that he has for any situation is amazing. Uh, so many times when he's running late, or we're running late and delaying his case, and there's quite a bit of discussion when I'm going to start, and we keep running away from him so we can avoid this discussion. <laughs> but uh, every time is that at the heat of the moment, is that I ask Doug, is that, Doug, I, I need you to tell me, how do you keep this calm uh, uh, approach and uh, uh, posture? And he said, and I will never forget that. He said, as much life will teach you how uh, to get things and approach things in a calm way. Uh, so I truly respected that in him. He was always uh, uh, a physician who cares about his patient, that he always call if there is any dispute in management. He grabs the cell phone and call that attending and say, let's discuss this. Uh, another moment in my life that I truly will never forget in a personal level is that they went through what Doug went through when he broke his arm. And uh, for somebody who's active all his life, it's really hard when you feel that you're weak and uh, you're really going through a tough time. I, when I was at home in the uh, post-recovery, the first eight days, a phone call comes from Doug and I was shocked that uh, he's calling me because I didn't know that anybody knew what I went through. But the first thing I hear his voice in a calm manner and say is, Esmat, how are you doing? I said, I'm doing okay, dog. I think I really uh, went through an accident. He said, no, I know. That's why I'm calling you, because I want you to know you'll be fine. You'll be back to normal. Look at me. Things will get better. So the professional part and the human part that uh, uh, I saw in dog is I will, it will stay with me for the rest of my life. And uh, everybody's lucky who will know him, and I want to tell his family, Kathy and the rest, is that you should be proud of your dad, because he's somebody that everybody who knows has the utmost respect for him. Clear. We have a song we think 
Who <laughs> might like? I'm pleased to know he was a Beatles fan, so this is In My Life by the Beatles. Places I remember all my life, though some have changed, some forever, not for better, some have gone, and some remain. All these places had their moments with lovers and friends. I still can recall Some are dead And some are living In my life I've loved them all But of all these friends And lovers there is no one compares with you, and these memories lose their meaning. When I think of love as something new, though I know I'll never lose affection for people and things that went before, I know I'll often stop and think about them. In my life, I love you service. You placed in his hands a, a special thing that could only be rivaled by his, his passion for people. You shaped our lives and you shaped our hospital in a way that was special through his, through his work and through his love and through his hands. There are so many stories. We don't have enough stones here to, to tell all the stories. We thank you for the blessing that he was, and we ask that his blessing continue to be a part of Truman. We lift up his children and ask that you bless them, and we know that his life of work will continue through them. We, we ask that these stories that we told and the other stories that haven't been told yet, that they would continue. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I don't know. 